Well, welcome everyone. We are going to kick off straight on time because I went to a talk on cultural differences recently and realized that is appreciated in this particular conference from, from, a, from, a, from a random survey of the room. So we're going to go straight in if that's okay with everyone. So welcome and thank you all for coming. My name is Claire Dillon. You're here for the measuring success in academic OSS or open source software. Um, and we are here to discuss this with my illustrious panel. Now, you will notice that we do have one change in the panel lineup. So I do want to say that Dawn Foster, who has kindly joined us, is not Mike Nolan, which may cause some confusion, but poor Mike um, couldn't make it here today. So, uh, so Dawn very kindly stepped in uh, to replace him on this panel. So thank you, Dawn. But uh, she is joined by Saeed Chowdhury and uh, Sean Goggins and myself, Claire Dillon. Um, and so we're going to kick off today by letting everyone give a brief introduction of uh, who they are and one of the reasons why they're so interested in academic software, uh, open source software indeed. So Saeed, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Do we want to do the what? Oh, we do. So in terms of folks in the room, how many people here are from the academic sphere coming from academia? Ooh, good, excellent. And industry for everyone else? Would folks? Other, other in the middle. <laughs> I see Tim doing a little dance, so that's cool. That, that works, that works. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's scientific software. That, that works, scientific software? Specifically, we're gonna, okay. we will work, we'll work on a classification later. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you're all very, very welcome. But it's so wonderful to see so many people who are actually involved in, the, in that academic space as well. So Saeed, would you like to get kick started? Sure. Uh, so I'm Saeed Chaudhry. I lead the Open Source Programs Office at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and I've been in academia most of my career, except for two years working for the United Nations. And um, I can say sitting from the OSPO uh, lens, I'm interested in academic open source because it's so very, very interesting and varied and diverse. And I'll kick that off by saying something I said at the panel yesterday in the academic industry engagement that uh, university open source is made up of large numbers of small projects, um, that there are some big projects as well, but it's mainly characterized by smaller teams, uh, large numbers of projects. People don't need permission to start projects. Uh, there's no formal review process uh, and so on. So it's a very different kind of environment, I think, in some ways than uh, maybe the private sector or even the government sector. And there are lots of different use cases and lots of different pathways, and we'll get into more of that in just a bit. Thank you, Saeed. Dawn? Yeah, so I'm Dawn Foster. I, I've been doing this open source thing for a really long time, but most of that time was spent in industry. So companies like, like Intel and VMware, for example. But uh, now with uh, Chaos, I'm the director of data science. So I spend a lot of time thinking about research and, and software in general. I also spent a few years as a little little divergence getting a PhD where I studied the Linux kernel for a couple of years and looked at collaboration in the kernel. So so now my role is is kind of a, a mix of practitioner and, and research. Thank you, Don. Sean? Um, Sean Goggins. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Missouri. Also uh, helped co-found the Chaos Project. Um, my interest in university open source is really begins with open source research and scientific software. So, um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. I'll let you keep the mic. Uh, and my name is Claire Dillon. Um, I'll be your host today. Uh, I also had a long history in industry, but have recently transitioned to the academic space. I'm now a PhD candidate with the University of Galway in Ireland. Um, I also am a community lead with a group called Curious, which is a community for university and research institute OSPOs. Um, and it's in that context that, uh, that we're particularly interested in understanding about measuring open source in academia. So, Saeed, you already kind of kicked us off on the discussion of what makes academic open source different. But can you maybe elaborate on, for folks that may not be familiar with the, I suppose, the, the specific unique challenges that comes with the idea of open source in academia? Yeah, there, there's a few. Uh, and we, we think of them as challenges, but also opportunities. Opportunities, of uh, course, as well. <laughs> at least that's what I say to people in the university. Uh, so part of it is a fairly typical profile is a, is a faculty member and that faculty member is graduate students or maybe the undergraduate class that they're teaching. Uh, and that's, unless you're at a very large state school, um, it's typically very small numbers. And even at state schools at the graduate level, it's still a, lot, a large number of people. 
And so, for example, if you're trying to say, you know, we have tools and metrics to tell you how many contributors you have, how active they are, and so on. Uh, it's not unusual they might say, well, it's those grad students in that office over there, right? They, they talk to each other every day. So it's a very different kind of messaging that has to take place. And there's two different lenses that come into play. One is at that very small individual level, but then those wrap up in sort of a fractal way, if, if that makes sense, that all those labs are part of a department, those departments are part of a division, those divisions are part of the university and so on. So we have to think of open source at those different levels as well. Uh, how does it appeal to the small individual project team? How does it appeal to a provost, uh, is the term in the US, sort of the chief academic officer, if you will, who has to think across all of those different projects and, and all those different kinds of contexts. That's a very different message than, than the one you might say to a, an individual faculty member. And then of course, there's the different uses or, or functions, if you will. Uh, there's research using open source software. There's research around open source software, sort of as, as a research object itself. There's education in terms of just teaching the students how to think about open source software. Then there's education in terms of using open source software as a laboratory and so on. Uh, there's a whole, what we call in the US translation piece is how do you take the open source software of the institution and then transfer it into different contexts, typically through technology transfer, but the OSPO is playing a bigger role in that as well. Uh, and how do you have impact outside of the university? So having to account for all those different types of profiles is, is, is a bit of a challenge but it does also give you the opportunity to have different ways of messaging and different ways of engaging people. Thanks, Saeed. And Dawn, from your experiences, um, particularly as a practitioner in the academic space as well, can you add to that in terms of your thoughts around the differences between what we might be familiar with in terms of maybe the other types of projects you engage with within chaos and what you've seen from the academic world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, projects, the projects do tend to be very, very different. So when you look at a lot of industry projects, um, you know, a lot of cases it's around, it's around, you know, innovation and, you know, building, building a community. And when you look at, at research projects, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's a researcher who's doing, doing something very specific for their research needs. And they, they may or may not care about building a community around it. They may or may not care about continuing to maintain that piece of software. So, a lot of the traditional ways of thinking about open source and a lot of the traditional metrics that we think about within the chaos project may or may not apply depending on what that particular researcher or research group is is planning to do with that piece of software. I, I, I love it. In, in the prep session we, and even in the conversation we had yesterday about the kind of uh, collaboration with industry, there was, a, there was that talk about that very difference in terms of the the, the, the consideration of time within academic open source. Um, and one of the comments that was made in yesterday's panel was, you know, in, in academia, sometimes it's okay if these projects die. Like no one, no one minds that, that they were built to die. They were built to maybe, maybe not die, maybe go and live in some nirvana just as they are forever. <laughs> but, uh, but, but there's certainly this idea that, that, that the time, the nature of time in academic open source can sometimes be different. Do you want to maybe comment on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. That was that was something I was very much unprepared for when I took a little detour to get my to get my PhD, um, because uh, you know in, in industry and I also worked for a couple of startups. It's it's very it's very fast paced and you tend to do things very quickly. And in in academia, things take years and years and years. You know, you work on a paper and it may it may take you years and years before you actually see it get published. And you know, I I finished my PhD in two thousand eighteen. And I still really haven't, you know, I've got all this code sitting in a private GitHub repository and data sets and things that um, my, my, my supervisors, now I actually, I actually own it because I self-funded my PhD, so I could put it out there. But my supervisors are like, you know, maybe we could get another paper out of that. Um, so I really, I really haven't. So, you know, I can give people copies of my thesis, but it hasn't been published yet. And my data hasn't been published because maybe one more paper. And that was, you know, I, I finished it in 2018. And so that's a whole different timeline than, than what I'm used to in industry. Whole different meaning to time, I would say. So Sean, uh, what about your, your observations in terms of the differences? Uh, I mean, I would build on what Saeed and, and Don said and just point out that one of the notions of time, as you mentioned, is that open source 
research projects can be dead for a year while they're waiting for more funding. And when we look across the universe of open source, we would look at that as a bad sign, but you oftentimes with this software have to poke a little bit <laughs> to, to see if it's really dead or if the person's just getting more funding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, to see, I'd say just, just making the point that the grants are the driver for creating the software many times. And in, in many cases, especially in the life sciences, where there's a big footprint on my campus at the University of Missouri, open source software is really how they do their research. It's uh, uh, machine to machine, running different open source programs, and this, this thing, this collection they call pipelines, um, they're glued together, usually in kind of a one-off way, lab by lab. And, and actually, that's a really interesting point because not only this, this n like the nature of the projects differ, the nature of time differs, the nature of the people involved is very, very different. I mean, can you, can you speak to, I mean, I can only imagine becoming a life sciences researcher. I'm not a life sciences researcher, but, but, but you know, these folks are not developers, you know, they're by not, nature, right? So, no, so not how, how do they handle this whole engagement with the open source community in that respect? It's really problem driven. I need to do an analysis, so I need to write some software. I'll get a postdoc or a PhD student to do that for me. And if it's useful beyond my lab, uh, it will be shared. And if it's useful beyond my lab, there's also a possibility of getting funded to continue to work on it. Uh, but, a, sorry, go ahead. Uh, but the, I mean, for, faculty, the real problem with open source software is that we don't really get rewarded for it. Like I have to tell the story of why this is valuable every time uh, I do my five year post tenure review process and just explain, you know, I might only have three papers a year instead of 10, but I have all of this other stuff that I'm working on that's important. So, yeah. so, so can I just build on that yeah, for please a second? Do. I was, I was talking to somebody about this problem recently and what they were saying was, you know, they have, you know, postdocs who do this, do this work and they're funded out of grants for whatever. But the way it works is that postdoc um, is, you know, done with their career, you know, their job and, and they leave. And then, and then they can start searching for a new one to take their place. And there's literally just no handoff on a lot of the software that these labs are doing because they get one person to do it and then that person leaves and then they can recruit another person because you know, they can't, there's no overlap in, in, in the people and there's no way to create that overlap because of the way the funding works. How, how does that even work in terms of, you know, deciding who a maintainer would be? I mean, does that mean that if you are a maintainer as, say, as a postdoc or you've got, you know, access and all that sort of thing, does that disappear as you leave the job? Or is, I mean, does the expectation disappear? How, how do people hand off between that? Or do they successfully? Uh, poorly. <laughs> poorly is the um, answer. <laughs> what, what, what I would say is... Um, no, nobody becomes a graduate student or postdoc to become a maintainer, <laughs> right? I, I don't think anyone writing an application to a university says, I really want to come here and be a maintainer of your dormant open source software. That's <laughs> typically not a good strategy even to get admitted, quite frankly, as a graduate student, right? So there's a serious misalignment between the original intention of why some people came to a university and then the roles like maintainer. So uh, one point that's interesting is uh, the Curious Network that uh, Claire mentioned and CMU's OSPO has been funded by the Sloan Foundation, the Alfred P. Alfred, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And the program officer there is uh, Josh Greenberg. And he also helped fund a lot of the so-called research data management services within universities uh, in the US. And one observation he shared with me over time is one of the biggest changes that happened is there are a whole new set of roles within universities that didn't used to exist. So my previous institution was Johns Hopkins, where we started one of the first research data management services group. And when I first wrote up a job description and sent it to human resources, their first question was, what is this? And their second question was, what existing job does this map to? Uh, uh, we won't get into the long sordid tale of how, how to work that through. But if you fast forward now, universities have these jobs in the HR systems, they're in a recognized role. It's my hope that one thing the OSPOs and universities will do is make maintainers a recognized role in the university HR systems and so on. But we're not there yet. Um, and if you think about the origin story for most of these open source projects in the university, the grant uh, you know, funder may require that you release your software open source. 
that's a very different motivator <laughs> than uh, we're working on a product and we want to make it open source from day one to build a community around that. So having to deal with that sort of difference between uh, what may be more typical open source projects in university or academic ones is really important. So you've started talking about motivations and even, you know, what, what constitutes success in, in, in that context. So, I mean, we're here to talk about measuring success for academic open source. So if you were thinking about how to communicate success, because it sounds like there's very, many different stakeholders in the academic ecosystem, um, many different viewpoints of what success might mean. So can you maybe elaborate on what does constitute success then in an academic sense for open source software? It's not been credited. No, go ahead. You can start. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's two ways I think about that. One is to build on existing metrics, right? Um, so we, we talked about this in the prep session that, you know, software citations, right? How, how software is getting used and cited in publications, which is not an easy thing to do. And there are challenges around that. Sean, you might want to talk about those from the publisher perspective. Uh, but those are recognized metrics that academics care about, right? They, they care about citations. They care about so-called impact factors and so on. I will say though, we need to be very careful about avoiding what were some of the perverse unintended outcomes from that world um, and people gaming the system. There is someone who has made his cat one of the highest cited authors, <laughs> right? He, he literally gamed Google Scholar and now his cat is a, a world famous cited whatever researcher, uh, I don't know what discipline he picked. So we need to avoid that. Um, and so if you imagine like, pull requests, right? How many pull requests did you did you create? Well, gee, I can go fix a space issue in your documentation and now I've got credit. So we need to be careful about those existing metrics, but we need new ones too. Software is very different from papers and it's very different from data. So we need to think about new ones as well. We also need to think about the people who care. It's not just the faculty, right? It's also the funders. It's also the administration and the metrics may have to be different, you know, for, for those different audiences. Great. Thank you. Don. And just, yeah, just to add on that. So as, as the person who doesn't work at a university, one of the things that has been really fascinating to me within the chaos university OSPO working group is how many OSPOs have very, very different goals. So, so the problem with, with talking about measurement for, for you know, academic environments or academic OSPOs is you know, some, some of these universities are very focused on research. You know, some of them are mo more focused on, um, you know, on, on the education side of the business. And so, so the variation is, is pretty wide and you need to think about what it is that you're, just like in a company, what, did it, what is it that your company is trying to achieve you know, what is it that your academic or university is trying to do and how does open source how does open source play into that and then figuring out what metrics what metrics you need depending on the, the type of university or research group it is and I think one mistake you can make if you're trying to tiptoe into the university open source space is to think that there is some similarity or common understanding about it from university to university and there's that's strangely not, I've been at my university in my 12th year. I've had I've gone through three or four different cycles of um, intellectual property attorneys that I have to explain what open source software is to. So you know, every two or three years we we lose one, they rotate, and I have to sit down with them and explain what this is and how intellectual property works in open source um, and where they can look. And that's just kind of. I know it's an unusual expectation. If you're an open source, you might think we all understand what it is. And when you walk into a university, that's not true. And if I, if I may, I would, just because I wanted to reflect on one of the actual insights that came from yesterday's panel. Yesterday, we had a panel um, talking to some industry folk who were actually funding research with the expectation of open source outcomes because they were talking about how that actually helped them in terms of collaboration. Um, and I think uh, just when you're speaking about technology transfer and what, what success looks like for various different people. Um, you know, the, the, the whole idea that, that an open source project may actually be a pathway for doing more industry collaboration, um, that can be a success factor in itself. So it may, it may not be the vast, like that you have to have hundreds of, of open source projects, that may not be a factor for the university, but one high profile one that's an industry collaboration could, 
be huge, right? So, you know, th there are there are these very different, I suppose, success measures that an institution might look at. Would you agree? Or Ab absolutely, and every university is, is going to be a little bit different. <laughs> that's that's often the case. <laughs> that that is true. Uh, but one thing I will say is, it, it's somewhat ironic that at least in the U.S., universities don't have a lot of mechanisms to work together in formal ways. One of them are grants. Um, they're legal. In fact, grants are legal agreements. So they're pretty much all legal agreements. They're MOUs or data use agreements, um, so on and so on. One of the most powerful arguments along the lines you just described, both of you, is that open source software is a much more frictionless way to work with someone outside the university. Right? There, there are legal assertions or legal statements or provisions being made to open source licenses as well, of course. But it allows the university to engage with a partner in a much more frictionless way than signing a memorandum of understanding, for example. Um, university contracts offices have a very difficult job. They're not always the most favorite office for the faculty, right? True. Um, so <laughs> uh, this, th th this has become an interesting way of promoting open source as you can work with industry or the universities in a much more seamless way. Right. And, and then, so thinking about, I suppose, the discussions that we've had, and I, just again to, to probably, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but to put this in context, we've all met each other in the chaos working group for academic, the, the chaos academic working group, which is where we discuss these kinds of issues. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful mix of hearing experiences, but also going through the actual uh, process that chaos often use of goal, question, metric kind of process. Um, and I suppose through through that, I, I remember the first working group we had at this at one of the chaos cons early on. Um, and we went through, you know, 37 different goals or something of, for, for what you might want in an academic open source context. And, and we were kind of saying, okay, so so which of the existing chaos metrics would, would actually match these goals? Like, are, are there any that you've already thought of? And there was probably very little overlap. So I suppose in the context of the discussion so far, can you maybe have a, have a talk about the ones that perhaps are closest and where we've seen gaps or where there may be other systems in place that help people demonstrate success or demonstrate stuff in the academic context? Yeah, I think I think also, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pre-answer that question. Um, I think what a lot of so just to back up a little bit, there's, there were a whole group of academic OSPOs, university OSPOs that were funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation all at once. It was, what, 11, six? Six and then six again in the following Yeah, year. okay, six and then six. Um, so there were a whole bunch of these OSPOs that were formed kind of at the same time. And one of the commonalities across them was that when the OSPO first spun up, they had they have no idea what they even have, like what open source projects there are. Because if you think about a university, they can't even just search Google for, for the university because they're going to get every student that ever came through that university. And so how do, they, how do they even find the projects that they're working on? So even before we get to what metrics are important, it, you know, it's a, a process of just, just trying to find what they, what they have, which there, unfortunately, is no good solution to that. I think there are some, some ways that people are, are trying to do it through, you know, Google API searches and, and things like that. But but that's that's one one of the challenges that these universities are facing. Yeah. It, my university has no idea what the full scope of their open source contribution profile is. And do you do you want we, to oh yeah sorry we don't have an OSPO. Um, so we're not even trying yet. We, we are trying, but we don't know. Either. <laughs> so so don't, don't feel too badly. Um, or we can all feel badly, either way. So, so one thing I'd say is, uh, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, um, that maybe some of the specific metrics around number of contributions or so on may not make as much sense, just given the lack of speed, lack of scale, however you want to think about it, and sort of the varied nature of, of the, the use cases and so on. But I do think some of the concepts are still incredibly important. So we actually have conversations now with faculty about the health of their open source software. You know, the first time I said that, it's like, what? What are you talking about? So just being able to think of, at that level, at least, of the metrics, right? That there's this concept of the health of your project. And Sean, you're absolutely right. Grant funding is rarely continuous. So when there are these gaps, 
you know, the health clearly changes, right? And, and I gave this very bizarre example of like a medical case of a person, right? Having a heart attack, going into a coma, coming out, whatever. Maybe not the right metaphor, <laughs> <laughs> but, but something like that so they understand there is a life cycle here, right? That you, you don't just start something, put your grad student on it, and then a miracle occurs, right? That, but that idea of the health and the life cycle, whatever the specific metrics might be, I think that's a really important place for all to start and to get people thinking about that further upstream, right, when they actually start the activity, not in the dormant phase. I won't use the medical metaphor. I think we call them vampires. Oh. <laughs> From the dead. <laughs> the, funding, the funding comes back and, and they, they're back. Beautiful gothic yeah. creatures yeah. Of, yeah, exactly. of the night. No. <laughs> um, so in terms of, I know there are some activities that are happening in the academic world. Um, work on, uh, for example, things like either ORC ID or ORCID. We were, we were debating how to, how, to, how to pronounce that earlier, but, um, but things like that in terms of actually helping, you know, tools that allow researchers to link their software in GitHub with, for, for example, an identifier from a, a scientific perspective. Do you want to maybe talk about some of the work that's going on in that space, just to actually give people an idea? So I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I have an ORC ID or ORCID, and it's associated with my GitHub profile. Mm -hmm. And for some of the software that I've put out open source wise, there's a citation format that you can use. So you can put a citation metadata file, um, which will have, you know, ask people who use your software to cite it using that paper as a proxy uh, for credit. These are some of the things that are happening. Yeah, there's also uh, integration with GitHub with something called Zenodo, um, where you can generate a so-called digital object identifier for a snapshot of your software. Uh, there's a whole other set of conversations we can have around whether that is a good identifier for software or not, but I'll just duck that for the moment. But I think of these as really important pieces of infrastructure or pathways, right, to start talking about metrics and citation and things like that. So again, a faculty member might say, you know, why should I do this? Why should I care? But if you can get back to, well, if we can actually track where you're doing something, who, who's doing it, we can then start to help you tell the story around this, right? And then you can start to talk about reward. Even if that's just locally, even if it's for your own so-called reappointment promotion tenure case, uh, it's one thing to say, I've worked on a lot of open source software where how, how do i know that to be able to point to something and simply say there it is or at least there's a record of what i've done that can be really important in the reward structure of a university yeah, i'll add i was recently at um, my research institution's yearly summit and for i've been there before and there'd been very little discussion around open source but the theme this year was a lot around open research and one of the projects that got called out and was presenting uh, was a project called Bioconductor, uh, which had turned up, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative had done uh, a project where they were, they were scraping papers to try to find references to software. And this had turned up as one of the most cited software in the area of cancer research in terms of decoding genomes around cancer. Um, and as a result, they got a grant from Chan Zuckerberg and um, uh, CZI uh, to continue that work and to spread the impact of the software caused huge waves of, of interest from the entire research community when they realized that that was something that would be rewarded. So once these systems, I suppose, are being put in place, even if they're not perfect, they do provide mechanisms for growing awareness and helping people understand that there is a potential to have impact with your research software, maybe beyond the idea of publishing papers. So it's, it's, a, it's a really great thing. So we do want to leave time for folks to actually ask questions from the floor. So would anyone have a question that they would like to share with the panel at this point in time? Georg. Thanks, Ed. Hi, I'm Georg from Biturgia, also member of Chaos. And one of the interesting conversations recently was uh, we were working with the client to assess the health of their open source projects. And one of the projects was uh, from the university and said, yeah, this is something very specific that was built and has not been maintained, but we are still using it because that is like the implementation of, of this. And so there, there's um, that as we move, and, and this is to me success, uh, 
when something that is created knowledge created in the university gets used in products. Uh, but then we have the misalignment of the incentives to maintain or um, not maintain or make sure it doesn't disappear in the future. So maybe you can talk about that longevity of the knowledge that is created. It wouldn't be unusual for an uh, open source project to, from a scientific perspective, to get absorbed into some commercial stream and never even know about it. Like, I don't know if there's communication between the people using it in the university anymore. Um, that's an interesting success story, though, because if it's not maintained, it's ultimately going to fail. So someone's going to have to take over the maintenance of it, right? So one of the reasons that academic open source projects don't get maintained is fear. And by that, I mean, if I make this change, what other changes am I going to have to make? And the person who wrote the code is no longer here. So that's partially what I'm getting at in terms of health, right? Is if you can understand that you have a single grad student or postdoc working on this uh, and actually see, you know, say visually <laughs> through a dashboard, <laughs> what the implications are of being dependent on that person. And you can see that maybe that person's contributions are going down because they're burning out or they're about to graduate or whatever the case may be. It's really important for people to understand, to plan for something like that, right? So it, it isn't always just the case of, you know, we don't want to maintain it because we don't care. It's because it's working right now it's supporting papers that are citing it right now. And if we make changes and mess it up, that's going to be a real problem in terms of the scholarly record. So giving people the tools and awareness and knowledge and understanding of how to make those changes, I do think will make a difference in this. I, I don't want to make changes to this. Yeah, and I, so I think this is the real value of having academic and university OSPOs is that the OSPO the OSPO team can really help people think through these these types of conversations. They can help them think through, you know, should this really be open source? Should you set clear expectations in the README that it's not going to be maintained? It was only used for this one paper and you're not going to make changes to it. And so I think that the that's the real value of having an OSPO is being able to work with your, your researchers, your faculty, even your students to help them really understand how to do this whole open source thing in a way that sets the expectations properly. And so perhaps even in the context of community health, we may need to broaden those definitions because as we were just describing the undead projects earlier or, or the ones that may be dormant or whatever analogy you might want to use, that's not to say that Vampire. they not have, not, they may not, they may actually fulfill their goal. They may actually be healthy in the context of the expectations that were set around that project. You don't want the, you don't want them turning up as a red blinking light on a health dashboard either, right? So, so maybe, maybe that does require a different set of frame, framework for thinking about what health means in the academic context. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like uh, you discussed Zenodo, you know, they, they let you create a DOI for one version of the software. That is actually very important for scientific reproducibility that I can tell you specifically what version of a piece of software I use to arrive at the results I have. And that way we all know if it later comes out that there was some kind of problem with that version, there's clarity about the mistakes that cascaded into my research. Hasn't happened yet, by the way. <laughs> so any other questions from the floor? No? One more? Yes. I will, I'll run down. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. We want to get it for the recording. Yeah. It's, uh... So we can reproduce this. And... Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much. I wonder if much of this problem is only academic, or have you seen this in a lot of, let's say, other grants-based industries? You know, like nonprofits, like humanitarian, and such. Because, like, I don't have so much experience in academic like, academia, but it's very similar to what I'm familiar with. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> we'll let you catch your breath. <laughs> um, so I. Uh, 
it, it is a good question. I, I don't represent those communities or sectors, but um, I, I'm going to say I would not be shocked if that were the case. Uh, and I'm not trying to pick on any particular organization or particular movement or so on, but there's this entire ecosystem of digital public goods that are very important for the sustainable development goals. We've talked about that a lot at this, at this event. Uh, I, I don't think there's a central organization managing <laughs> all the open source of digital public goods. So I suspect they're in very different states of, let's use the word health, um, and that people have left that who worked on those projects. So you're, I think your insight is, is right on the mark. I only have a, a small sample of experience working with UNICEF a number of years ago. And in, in that case, the projects very much uh, came and went based on not so much funding directly as volunteer interest or support. There'd be key people in a community that would drive it for a certain amount of time, but if they weren't replaced or rotated. So it's a, a slightly different, but I think adjacent problem. But I would also like to add, in, in the same way as it may be a challenge, maybe it's an opportunity for the academic space, because as we were talking about earlier, we focused a lot in this panel about research outputs, but of course, you know, education of undergrads and students and getting them involved in technology is obviously, you know, a, 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 one of the goals of universities. And it's been proven, I think this was said in one of the earlier panels, it's been proven that, um, that for example, when you get to work on meaningful outputs, like perhaps the software that supports the SDGs, that can often attract a much wider, diverse set of folks that might be interested in contributing to that. So perhaps, we haven't talked about the kind of student population and their impact on the open source world, but maybe that's one of these opportunities from an academic space that, that we should consider in that respect in particular, the tie into public goods. Yeah. My first foray into open source was actually a, a, undergra a undergraduate curriculum project that the National Science Foundation funded to, for, to do exactly that. And we created projects that were for social good and then taught, created a curriculum around them to help other professors learn how to teach into those projects. Now, there's an anti-pattern way of doing this that uh, Saeed mentioned earlier, which, which involves uh, just sending your undergrads out to contribute to some open source project. And, oh, to, to, you know, <laughs> crashing them with a 100 undergraduates trying to make minor contributions. I, th I think the word we used is rude. <laughs> Don't do that. Maybe talk a little bit about your experience you have with Augur and students. Yeah, I mean, I have a, I maintain a project called Augur under the Chaos Project, and I've had undergraduates contributing in my classes for like the last seven years or so. And of those, I think about 20 students have had something merged into it. So that's 20 out of probably a thousand students over that period. So not, not a huge take, a lot of pull requests that didn't get merged, but I, I think it does ground the students in something real when they can work with an open source project because it's more than just toy code at that point. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's a really great story because I think one aspect we can look at with students and the, and the education from the faculty perspective is open source as a laboratory in some sense, right? So the laboratory experience is a very big deal and or the seminar experience in the humanities or so on. Um, and, you know, to, to the earlier point we were making is most faculty would not assume they could send their students to someone else's lab and say, here, I'm, I'm here to clean up your lab for you and do something useful. So there are benefits in terms of trying to think about that as you can have a lab and the reason you have it is you can guide your students through the process of what it means to understand the methods and the culture and the social norms of working in a lab. That's all true for open source. And I think that the other point I want to make is the time dimension, right? Is that, I'm trying to think about how to say this, uh, students are more open to, to sort of being guided about best practices around certain things. And they don't necessarily have sort of hard set expectations about how to do things. And many of those students go on to become faculty members or work in industry or work in government or work in non NGOs and so on. So we are seeding future generations of people when we educate them and by giving those better sense of how open source works in the real world, not just, you know, what you've heard. I think that'll have a longer term, but, but much more profound effect.
Great. Well, thank you. Well, we're coming to the very end of our panel now. So maybe I'll invite each of our panellists to share some final thought or action. Anyone want to give one final hope for the future, perhaps? Uh, my hope for the future with this audience is that we can start to see ways that scientific software and research software um, is adjacent to the work that we do and, and find ways to help those projects form a more organized, coherent uh, umbrella that they can exist under. Because I think right now most researchers are just grasping at straws to even understand what open source is. Yeah, I would say that my my hope for the future is more on the education side. I would I would love to see more universities actually educating students and how to work in in open source and how to how to do that in a way that is is collaborative and that they can sustain their careers based on it because you know every company uses open source software, right? So it's it's not like it's a skill that's not going to be widely applicable and yet unfortunately, you know, it's often like a single token class in a lot of computer science programs. And I would I would love to see open source sort of incorporated throughout the curriculum at more universities. So my hope is, uh, well, I'll tell you, someone asked me, why have you worked in universities for so long? And I said, well, because I actually want to see problems get resolved. And it takes a long time in universities. Having said that, universities are great places to solve difficult problems. And I do believe we are starting to see the inflection point where faculty, students, administrators are recognizing the importance of open source software, are recognizing that there's a great deal of knowledge outside of the university that we can tap into. And there are very important signals uh, to this effect. So Claire mentioned the Curious Network. We met with people from the US National Science Foundation at one of our first meetings. And the NSF has a program called Pathways to Open Source Ecosystems. And the latest call for proposals mentions OSPO staff directly, says you can have them involved in your proposals. Those kinds of signals from large funders like NSF in the US are incredibly important. So I would just ask all of you to help become part of the journey to make this work in academia. And hopefully it won't take as long as I've been working in academia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Saeed. I'll add ask one more thing, and, and that is for those of you who are interested in this space, whether you're from academia or whether you're from industry and maybe interested in actually doing collaborations with academia, or whether you have personal experience, because how many people here were students at one time? But for all of those reasons, if you are interested in this mission and you are interested in helping bring forward this discussion, um, please do join us at the Chaos University Working Group. We meet um, every second Wednesday in the afternoon or evening uh, European time, um, but all the calls are recorded, lots of stuff goes on on the Slack, so we would love to see you there. So um, thank you all for coming here today and uh, yeah, hopefully we can make a difference for measuring even more success in academic open source by this time next year. Thank you very much.